Hello and welcome to Stow Talks, a podcast designed to support people going through a relationship breakdown and all the challenges this brings. I'm Matthew Taylor. And I'm Lisa Gatchell, family lawyers at Stow Family Law. And today we're looking at what the recent changes to the family procedure rules on non-court dispute resolution actually mean for separating couples and perhaps to dispel some of the popular myths. So there's been some changes, 29th of April 2024. Um, there were changes made to the family procedure rules. So I guess we should start by saying what the family procedure rules are. Um, yep. So they are a set of rules that are aimed to govern the processes and procedures in the family court system, if you like. So that you know, we're meant we're meant to you know it's not law, <laughs> but we're meant to follow the, these rules and guidance. So what were the changes that came in on the 29th, Matt? Yeah. So. Um... This is all about NCDR, non-court dispute resolution. And it's basically the stuff, a way of sorting out family law issues without using court. And um, in April, there was a new part, part three was, well, uh, enhanced and amended to basically give the family court a greater ability to push people into non-court dispute resolution. Um, So NCDR, um, is stuff that we talked about quite a bit on the podcast. Uh, mediation is the sort of one everyone knows. Um, so that's two people with a neutral third party mediator who will facilitate assessment. But it's a bit wider than that now. So there's some other forms of NCDR. Things like arbitration, which is effectively private court proceedings. You hire your own judge and then you go through the court process, but it's all private. Um, something called a, uh, a P. Uh, PFDR, so Private Financial Dispute Resolution Hearing, which replicates part of the court system, a sort of negotiated settlement hearing. But again, you hire your own judge and you get to do that. And then things like early neutral evaluation. Um, one, I never get this the right way around. Uh, one couple, one lawyer, uh, two, two parties, one lawyer, one couple, one lawyer, <laughs> but basically where you get one lawyer who advises both spouses on a divorce rather than being individually represented. Things like that. So different methods of sorting stuff out. And the key to NCDR in this definition is that there needs to be some sort of arbiter um, or referee almost who will give a steer as to what the outcome is. So the new part three kind of gave the court greater teeth to say to people, no, you're not using court. This is a case where you should use NCDR because of reasons that we'll come on to, the, the court feels that either or both it's more effective and better for parties to use these systems or the court doesn't want people using the court i have my own views we'll come on to that in a minute maybe but i think that broadly kind of sets up you know the ch- the changes and it requires people to say if you're applying for court there's a new form because lawyers love forms um which says here are the efforts that we've made to engage in ncdr and here's why we are still in court so i think that that summarizes it broadly i mean lisa how do you see these things working in practice you know maybe we should run through what the positives are of these changes first and be a bit positive and then um i've got a few things to say on the flip side (laughs) we'll give matt his soapbox um so yeah i mean it is always better to reach a resolution out of court than to end up within um, lengthy and costly court proceedings. And I mean, court proceedings, they're not just costly as far as um, financially, but they can also be emotionally um, very costly because mm-hmm. you are you are in a process that is quite lengthy. It's going to take a number of months to resolve. So the idea behind all of this is to try and help parties to reach a resolution without having to enter the court system, which is overrun, has significant delays, and is is ultimately putting you know your your finances into or children into the hands of somebody that doesn't know you that you that you know doesn't know you doesn't know your children doesn't know your ex partner etc. So the intention of this is to try and help parties to to reach an agreement and to come together, um, which is great. I mean, as far as it being a big change, I'm just not necessarily convinced it is a big change because I think for most family lawyers the first conversation that we have in the first meeting is about the different ways in which you can um, have these discussions and you can reach an agreement. And I don't know many lawyers that would automatically, and I'm sure there are some, don't get me wrong, that <laughs> I'm, yeah. I'm not going to sit here and say there aren't any, but I don't, I don't know of many that would 
um, automatically sort of plug court proceedings. Um, you know, the conversations that we have with colleagues and with lawyers that are representing the other party in proceedings right from the beginning are very much, you know, what's the best way that we can do this? Can we do mediation? Can we do arbitration? Can we look at a private FDR? Um, and so I don't know whether this is necessarily going to change things massively in practice. What it does, I suppose, is it puts a little bit more pressure because there's now cost consequences potentially that the courts yeah. can have. So if you haven't properly considered um, non-court resolution and you end up in court proceedings, the judge can make cost orders against you. Um, and there, as you say, there is an additional form where I think you have to give a bit more information. So previously, we've always had to say whether mediation has been tried, but it was very much a tick box form. And some people very much viewed it as that, you know, I just need to get this form ticked and then I can make my application to court. So I think there's a bit more to it than that now. Um, and as you said, the court now aren't just looking at mediation. They have very much um, expanded the definition of the non-court dispute resolution for the purposes of the family procedure rules to include things like arbitration and private FDRs, etc. So I think it's great in that it will be at the forefront of people's minds. Um, I think it's great that if we can settle these cases without having to make an application to court, then ultimately that is in everybody's best interests. Um, and I think it's great that we are now concentrating not just on mediation, but various different types of non-court dispute resolution. Yeah, I, I, there's definitely some positives. And I think that's a really key, key point to make is that I think very few family lawyers run off straight to court. Um, certainly don't. Very rare. It will be the first port call and only if there's safeguarding and welfare concerns or severe domestic abuse or someone is on the cusp of you know transferring a huge amount of money somewhere where it shouldn't be sent to and you need to step in and do something about it so it's pretty pretty rare um i think in terms of um th this has already played out a little bit in some case law so a little bit of law here is that there's um, been a couple of judgments since these rules came in which give a flavor of how the court might address it so there was uh, there's been a couple of cases one called x and y um and then one uh, called NA and LA, which is a uh, judgment of uh, Nick Allen Casey as a deputy high court judge, where he um, basically said, oh, this is a sort of fairly big money London case, but nothing very complicated. And it's come for an application to the court. And this is a paradigm case for the use of NCDR because there's nothing complicated in here. You should be able to sort things out. Um, so he refused uh, at that first hearing to start the normal financial remedies process of listing the first hearing. He stayed the proceedings to require both parties to make submissions in writing about why NCDR, it, it, whether it was appropriate, what should be considered, and if it wasn't appropriate, why it wasn't be appropriate, and then they should go off and do that. And effectively, it's saying, go and do it. And I can't imagine that the lawyers are then going to kind of oppose that too strongly, given his judgment, because if it comes back before him, the court can make those cost orders. They can. The court can now say, you didn't engage in NCDR properly when we think you should, therefore you're going to pay the costs of the other side. So that will doubtless go off to some form of NCDR, which may or may not be the right, um, the right uh, uh, approach in that case. I think where I struggle with this, uh, well, there's a few grounds, but I struggle with, um, and I'm going to stress these are all my personal views, um, uh, I struggle with, NCDR, the way it defines and it groups together um, a number of processes, all the ones I've talked to earlier, which I don't think are the same and I don't think are analogous. And I think grouping together NCDR and pretending that mediation and arbitration should be addressed in the same way and should be considered in the same way is, um, I don't get it. I don't get it at all. So the rationale for a lot of this is that it will save parties costs and make things more amicable and better. Uh, if mediation can, uh, can be effective, then it absolutely does that. Absolutely does that. I completely agree. Does arbitration? I don't think it does. It's the same system as the court. It's running <clears> through your X hearings. Are your costs going to be any lower? Uh, you might do things a bit quicker, but you know, you might not. Um, are your costs, if I'm, if I'm doing a cost estimate for a client and it's arbitration versus court system, my cost estimate is going to be the same. My estimate of counsel fees is exactly the same. Um, it's still adversarial. You're still being positional. So it's not this happy, clappy, you know, sunshine, rainbows and kittens thing where everyone's getting on necessarily. And actually, I think you can do court and get on perfectly well. You know, it depends on your approach, not necessarily the, the format. Um, so 
I just don't think the sort of the the presentation of the NCDR changes of being better for families and less on costs. I don't think that's right. I just don't agree with it. I think that that can be the case with mediation, but my view is that the driver for NCDR is to get people out of court to reduce the pressure on the on on the public purse, and it's effectively privatizing um, court this uh, dispute resolution for families, which. Look, you, everyone's going to have their own views about whether the state should be funding that. I take the view that if people are having difficulties and the state has always provided some sort of funding to do it, it used to be a lot better with legal aid, but obviously that's gone. Then for the vast majority of people now expecting them to go to the costs and then pay their own judge, um, it that might be very well in this case, you know, NA and LA, where they've got oodles of money and it's millions and millions and they probably should be doing that because why should the state be funding them? But for the vast majority of people, there's now going to be this expectation of you go and fund your own dispute resolution because the state doesn't want to pay for it. Mm. So that's problem number one. I, I, I do that. get, I do get, but I, I hate to bring in like a north south divide here. But I think part of what you were saying about cost estimates and it being the same, maybe because you practice up north and your court systems I mean, do be. not have the significant delays that we have down in the south. Because I know that my cost estimate for arbitration will be significantly less than my cost estimate for court proceedings because we could get it done in six months rather than it taking 18 months to two years. So, um, you know, that in itself... Maybe. ...automatically, dramatically reduce the amount of costs that will be incurred. And I have had cases where we've arbitrated that have been just astronomically, significantly cheaper than similar cases that have gone through the court process. But I think that is because of where I'm located, we're, we're, you know, out south of the country, very close to London... Um, the court system down here does have significant delays. Now, I do agree that is it fair that because the court system is so underfunded um, and has those delays and isn't isn't working effectively, that parties should then have to pay for their judge. Um, but in the grand scheme of things, I mean, the cost of a private FDR judge is what five thousand pounds split between the parties equally. Um, they will more, in my experience, in the south, they will more than make up for that cost. In by going through that arbitration process than if they were to go through the court proceedings? Well, I mean, I say a couple of things. I've got a few London cases and don't struggle with timing. So maybe the London courts against the outside, the outer London, you know, sort of southeast and in your neck of the woods, you know, Hampshire and stuff, maybe is different. And so I don't necessarily see that as the case in my, my London cases, but I take the point. But if the system is now being changed, because there's big delays and big gaps in the southeast where people have more money to privately fund their cases and then that is being applied to up here in the northwest where actually i thought you know the delays aren't too bad by and large um but people have less money because there's less money outside the southeast then that probably exacerbates my point even further um and um you, you know if that's going to if, if and i do think there's a case in the family court system where frequently it is quite London centric. It is quite South centric. Um, and if that has a further negative impact on people who have generally got less money and they are further expected to pay five grand for a private FDR judge, then that doesn't seem in any way just um, to me. Um, and I don't think that is something that is in parties' best interests. Um, but I also think there's a further issue. I think there's another couple of issues with it. I think that it makes everything intensely tactical, intensely tactical. I think that because you have to set out your case at an early stage about whether NCDR is appropriate, now my first letter on every case is about why NCDR is appropriate in my case. Um, if you do not do it, then we will have costs from you because that's what you've got to do as a lawyer. And it is very positional and very heavy. And you're instantly going in with threats. Actually, this nice system is saying that, well, if you don't, then we're going to do it. Um, and you're putting people under pressure. And I think that there is a logical extension of this is that where you have cases where there may not be sufficient domestic abuse to um, engage the section of the family procedure rules, that means that um, the court has to consider the impact of domestic abuse. But there's clearly a power imbalance. There's been some difficulties between the parties. <clears throat> there is a party who, and this is often the case, needs to have some sort of uh, rebalancing. And the very first letter to them is saying, um, 
And of course, you don't know that when you get instructed by your client who's not, you know, is often not going to say, oh, yeah, I think my spouse is going to allege domestic abuse against me. If your first letter to them or one of your first letters is we want to do this NCDR and they are feeling, well, I can't possibly do that with my spouse because they behaved like X, Y and Z to me. You're putting people under a lot of pressure. So I actually query whether it's better for people individually to be forced into a system where they feel that the other person is calling their shots. I mean, do you think do you think there's any merit in that, Lisa, or am I being a bit um, scared? But I think, you know, if you go to court proceedings, then you're being forced into a system where mm. the other party's calling the shot. I don't see any difference in respect of that. And when we're mm. looking at, um, you know, the types of non-court dis- dispute resolution that we've got now, where there are power imbalances, I mean, there are, mul- there are so many more options available now um, than there were going back even five years ago. You know, we have hybrid mediation where you can take your lawyers along to mediation with you. You can do shuttle mediation so that you're sat in different rooms. Arbitration, obviously, like you say, it's 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 effectively um booper for the court <laughs> booper for the court process. So you know you're still going to have your lawyers, counsel, all of that there for you. So yeah, I don't know. I don't know whether I mean, I do agree that the aggressive, like the first letter, I do agree that, you know, going in straight away with all of this because you are you are setting yourself up to be able to claim costs further down the line if they don't accept. I mean, I, I do agree that that doesn't help because it takes away the the amicable nature of the first letter. The first letter should be much more about just trying to resolve it rather than thinking five steps ahead as to what could happen if you went to court. I think the Booper analogy is a good one, but I think that that booper analogy is extended to it's okay you can go booper or nhs but actually you can't go nhs so you have to go booper now and that is horrendously unfair to people who don't have the resources to do it you know we could have a whole different conversation about legal aid and the scrapping of the legal aid and you know what should be brought back but i don't even think it's a legal aid point necessarily i mean i agree with the devastation to legal aid has been appalling for the sector and appalling for a great number of people but even under the current system of legal aid where some people can get it and you get this huge swathe of people for whom legal aid is never going to be eligible, but they don't have that much money and they can't afford, you know, that legal fees are expensive because it's time intensive mm-hmm. and, and, and all these things. And there's a lot of expertise and a lot of time and consideration required. And then you're asking people to fund X, Y and Z on top of that um, and saying you have to do that unless you've got an incredibly good reason um and is the court going to accept cost as a reason well i don't think it is because i think there is a narrative which i don't agree with that uh the ncdr is always cheaper i think mediation is pretty much always cheaper if it works do i think the other examples are cheaper i don't and i do these you know i do arbitrations and i do private fdrs so i'm on board with the systems um what i struggle with a great deal is um the but a lot of my clients have got the money and they've got more money because they're big money cases because that's kind of the work that I tend to do. But most of the work that's being done by my team and the juniors in my team, you know, it's already expensive and, and we're trying to work with them to keep their costs down as much as possible. And then you say, well, previously you would have been able to go to see a judge who'd do this, but now do you want to pay five grand for your own judge on top? I mean, yeah, but you can... where am I getting that money from? You can focus it. You give, You get so much more control over it, don't you? So, for example, you know, if it is a small money case and the only thing you're arguing about is what should happen to the house or a pension or whatever it is, you know, we're not saying that that's going to take multiple days. and It's going to be incredibly expensive because you can narrow down the issues that you're asking. the You know, you might have agreed everything. You might have agreed everything apart from this sure. one issue. And then therefore you're just asking the arbitrator to deal with that. And it, it may well be that that can be done in actually a really short space of time. Whereas if you go through the court process and you're having to go through FDA, FDR, all the way to a final hearing, that is undoubtedly going to cost you more. I um, I don't I don't think I agree with that. I think I agree that um, if you can narrow the issues and go to an arbitration on the spoke point, that's a really effective thing to do. It's always been an effective thing to do, and it will continue to be so. But you can do that in court proceedings. You can say, I there are a couple of cases on my team at the moment where we've agreed everything apart from what happens with the pension share. So you issue, you go to an FDA. You deal with that on paper so you don't actually have the hearing and then direct it to go to the next hearing or you treat the first hearing as the FDR to settle things. Um, And you ask the court just to look at this one discrete point and then you settle things. So I think you can use the court system in that way. I don't have the slightest bit of problem with using arbitration and and private FDRs. I I think they're really useful. Um, And I think on bespoke issues, they are particularly good. Arbitration is particularly good on that. Um, 
but most cases you don't narrow the issues. Most cases you don't, or it takes a lot of time and money anyway to narrow the issues. Most cases you're either kind of dealing with everything in the round or you're going to court proceedings and dealing with everything in the round. So if you are dealing with everything in the round um, and you're initially, because the pre-action protocol now requires that your first letter really has to deal with NCDR. So you're launching it straight into, we need to do NCDR, let's do arbitration or whatever it may be. You're not even getting to the stage of narrowing down those issues to then consider it. You're saying we're dealing with everything and it's going to be NCDR. So I think that's, that, that's again, my objection is that it's pushing people to do this. I fundamentally can't get on board with, you know, the just the justification of it being better for families and reducing costs. I don't see it. I, I accept in some cases that will be the case, but I don't think as a blanket reason that is right. Um, and I, for me, it feels like a cynical attempt to reduce the pressure on the court system, which if that's the motivation, that's the motivation. I take the view that, you know, the state should probably be funding these things to allow people to resolve the disputes in the families where there are disputes. But, you know, people are going to have their own sort of small p political views about that, I guess. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I, mean, I do agree. The court system should just be improved. Like it should 100 yeah. percent be improved. It shouldn't be the case that people are having to pay um, privately to get a better service like that's not the way that the court system in the UK should work but do you not think we're sleepwalking into doing that in that the sector the profession as a whole which the voices are often southern based often dealing with people who've got more money who can stomach this are going I mean, okay we'll use NCDR it's great and that is forcing you know an option that is available for a small minority of people onto a compulsory thing for the, the rest of the population. Firstly, I mean, not everybody in the South has money. That's the first no, thing no, to no. say. That's, and equally, that's, that's they fair. will pay higher hourly rates um, than yeah. further up north. So the, the cost of the proceedings in themselves and, and getting representation is is significantly more. So it's not the case that sort of everybody down here um, has, has money and therefore is able to pay privately for it because we see people day in, day out that can barely afford to pay for an initial appointment, let alone instructor solicitor. Um, all the way through their case. Um, I I think it's it's about having this open dialogue, isn't it? And I, I, I think the problem is, is that with the changes in the rules, it's this forced, forced, um, you know, you have to do this or that's going to happen. And actually, <clears throat> as with a lot of things, it's often about education and it's often about um, just making sure people know that what their options are. And you know, it may be, you know, you're saying arbitration, if you've narrowed the issues, et cetera, et cetera. But it may be that actually when you come to the first appointment, you're sending that letter, maybe you try mediation and then mediation doesn't resolve everything. But you narrow the issues down to one issue and then you try um, arbitration or whatever it is. Um, so, I, you know, I think there are. There are pros and cons to it. Yeah. Um, I don't think it's the massive improvement that everybody is peddling it to be necessarily because I think the vast majority of lawyers have conversations with their clients about alternative dispute resolution all of the time um, and it's almost like it feels a bit like we can't be trusted and therefore you know we've got to now justify ourselves and show that we've done all of these things and mm. and back it up rather than an understanding that actually no you know what as a whole the professions here you know, we all become family lawyers because we want to support people. We want to help people when they're going, you know, that, 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 that's the reason that most of us came into this profession. And so we will go through all of the options with our clients and we will discuss the costs and the benefits and the pros and the cons and all of the rest of it um, with them right from the beginning. And I don't think that's going to change with this. Um, I, you know, from my experience, <clears throat> out, out of court dispute resolution is generally cheaper if you're able to reach an agreement. Um, but that being said, I also take the point and I agree that people shouldn't be forced into doing that because the court system's not fit for purpose. So, <laughs> yeah, no, I, completely. And look, I, I absolutely take the point that not everyone down the south has got money. I, I, speaking in generalities, there, I don't want to be, uh, you know, sign the north south divide more than more than there already is. <laughs> um, I think, you know, let's go back to this case, NA and LA, which is the one which says a paradigm case for NCDR and it's going to be quoted in every letter for a bit until there's more case law. In that case, in that sum very brief summary, um, there's a family home in London worth eight million mortgage free. There's a second London property, six and a half million mortgage free, uh, going undergoing renovations with budgeted costs of a further six and a half million free, uh, six and a half million. Um, there are other properties. There uh, is a property being built in Greece for three million euros. There are business assets. Apparently, one of the parties' fathers is a billionaire. 
and this is now going to be held up as the paradigm case why everyone should go into NCBR for a few months. And I struggle a great deal with that because that is the 0.0001%. And this is a problem with our system where the big money cases get reported and then you have to apply them to normal cases where really life is existing on an entirely different planet, if not galaxy. Um, so, you know, those are the sorts of cases that come before the sort of judges who tend to publish judgments, which then get filtered down. That's an issue. Yeah. Um, but equally, that that's... type of case is also going to have nuances, which means that actually we not might not be able to sort out things in non-court dispute resolution because it may be that valuations can't be agreed or, you know, the whole host of things, you know, if there's trust documents involved and things like that you know, you may get to a point that with the best will in the world with a case like that, actually it requires a judge and it requires yeah. judicial gatekeeping intervention to be able to even get to a point where we can start to look at what the settlement would be. Yeah, no, I I, I, complete, I completely agree with that. Um, I think, you know, the, these sometimes these cases which exist in a different orbit from the others uh, have negative impact on the bulk of the people who actually need to use the family system court system you know those parties don't need to use the family court system they can arbitrate of course they can and they can get they can get a judge to make a determination you know the costs are going to be massive but they're not going to be unaffordable given the assets involved um you know for mr and mrs smith with a house and a pension you know being told that you can't use the court and they're already stretched we talk so often on here about how stretched interim budgets are when people have to move out the family home and run two houses you know they've got that and then oh here's another layer of cost by the way um that's that's what i struggle with and, and just coming back to kind of my earlier point i think i really dislike the ncdr definition because i really dislike lumping in mediation with these other things which remain adversarial um which remains you know you are making submissions on behalf of your client um it's not mediation. Yeah. It's not one couple, one lawyer. It's not, you know, this early neutral evaluation. It is purely, in my view, um, an offloading of what I personally view as the state's responsibility to help people resolve family disputes onto, you know, it's boop it's forcing people into Bupa and not allowing them in the NHS. Let's run with it. I think that's a good analogy, Lisa, so let's run with it. So those those are my issues. And yes, I think there is a lot of I think a lot of the narrative around it, um, where people have been saying this is great, this is all shiny and new, and it'll stop all those dastardly lawyers running straight off to court. Like I take a little bit of exception to that on behalf of the profession because no one that I respect and like as a lawyer does that. And actually, even the lawyers I don't get on with so well, I don't think they run off to court on every case. They might run cases a bit differently to how I think they should run and, and things. But I think that's so rarely such an outmoded view. Um, and now there becomes this sort of narrative where, well, this is great, everything's NCDR and it's not your lawyer just running off to court. And, well, I don't, I don't recognise that as being true in any way. So I, slight, I slightly worry that the, the reaction of the profession sleeps, walks us into the system where there is now even less impetus for the court system to be properly funded. Um, and we are heading down the slope to, you know, um, to the family court system not being there for people who need it. Um, so that was that was cheery anyway. So that's my, uh, you know, I, I do want to try. Well, and obviously, let's do the point that we normally do at the end, at the end of these podcasts, because I've just been incredibly negative about this. Um, let's maybe sum up again some of the positives to this. Go on, Lisa, do you want to be because you've been a little ray of sunshine in this podcast as opposed to me. Which is clearly, <laughs> clearly got to have balance. Matt. This, <laughs> this is balance. This is very balanced. <laughs> Um, so should we just finish off with a little summary again, going back to what the, what these NCDR changes are and, you know, what the positives are for, for people trying to use yeah. them? I think the, the thing to bear in mind really is, is that you are being asked if you are embarking upon a divorce or separation or children's issues, you are being asked to consider um, alternative ways of resolving your dispute rather than going to court. So you need to be speaking to your solicitor very early on about what those options are, what they look like, the differences, because they are, as Matt said, they are very different. So, you know, mediation, for example, is you sitting down with your ex-partner and an independent mediator to see if you can um, reach an agreement. You can have hybrid mediation, which is where you do that, but you also have your lawyer's presence. You've got collaborative law, which is where you very much sign up at the beginning with your lawyers that you will not go to court. Um, and you have lots of round table. I'm probably oversimplifying this, but have round table meetings. We have, as Matt said, private FDRs, which is about having 
um, an independent third party who acts like a judge, effectively coming in for some, I always kind of view an FDR as kind of in-court mediation. <laughs> so where you both kind of give your view um, as to what you think a fair settlement would be and the judge that you've appointed will um, will we'll say what they think would be fair. You know, if they were dealing with it as a final hearing today, this is what they think. And the idea is that they try and unpick some of the deadlock that you might have reached on particular issues and aid negotiation. You go backwards and forwards. Um, and then we look at, so those are all, those are all um, aimed at helping you to reach an agreement. So nothing's going to be forced upon you in those circumstances. It's very much about helping you two to come together to reach an agreement. And then we have things like arbitration. So as Matt said, arbitration is very much private, court proceedings so you appoint a judge um, you have a hearing and the 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 arbitrator will give an award which is then transferred into into a court order so is binding their decision on you is binding um, so I think it's very much just you know the one thing I do like about these changes is is that we're not just talking about just mediation anymore I think it is opening people's eyes to the fact that there are lots of different options available court being one of them but there are lots of different options and I think it's about making sure that you're fully aware of what those options are right at the beginning, the pros and cons of each of those options, um, and seeing if there's one there that will perhaps help you in your circumstances. Yeah, I, I think that, you know, the options are really good for people. Um, I completely agree with that. And, you know, I'm going to stress in the vast majority of all our cases, that's the route we're going down, first of all. It's one of those systems or just dealing with things direct between lawyers, which doesn't form part of NCDR because it doesn't meet the definition because there isn't any kind of arbiter or referee or you know however you want to put it but that's still going to be the bulk of uh, the way in which we saw cases um so there's like that there is some good um i won't carry on too much but we're ending on positives here we're ending ending on positives positives. so there we go i will i I will i will leave it there i am positive that there are also some negatives however um as i have uh set out but you know it'll be interesting to see how it plays out it may be something for us to come back and revisit if we get a bit more case law as things develop over the year Uh, if i improve wrong i will quite happily say i'm proved wrong about loads of stuff all the time ask my kids um so you know we we will uh maybe revisit this and see how the changes are actually playing in in practice so that's it for this episode of stow talks thanks for listening if you would like more information on our podcasts head over to stowtalks.co.uk and please rate like share and review this podcast where you can (laughs) 